in and a guest for you this morning. Uh, Kai, why don't you introduce our guest? Oh man, we got uh, Zach. Zach, what was your last name again? I apologize. That's okay. Zach Minter. 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 There we go. Oh man, Uh, and so I honestly met Zach through uh, a friend of mine named Cody and uh, really, um, you know, it was just Zach. I kind of just welcomed in him into the grasshopper world and uh, he's already been in the monitor stuff so really uh you know it's just finding a another uh, another great food source for your animals and that's how me and zach got to meet really um and i, I honestly i've only really known him for sh- very short so it's only really really been since he got the grasshoppers um i haven't really i don't think i ever messaged him uh prior to that or even conversed through you know our normal ways of like forums or any of the groups or anything like that but i've been watching him and you know you see a lot of faces and you see a lot of awesome stuff happen and uh he's doing black dragons and uh, other uh, other species of varanids and so you know i've you know slowly been not creeping but been watching your efforts man and I, uh it's great to have you on um we've been really looking to have a uh have a salvatore guy on that's out of all the species of water monitors like i mentioned uh i mean sorry out of all the species of monitors the water monitor is still very high in demand very you know people love them they're still i don't know if they're really considered that anymore but the golden retriever of water mon- of monitor lizards you know <laughs> and uh i think we have all heard that before uh, they're just very intelligent when they're tamed they're really you can see it in their eyes and you can see their you know they're uh, the, the whole get up. They're a very intelligent animal and it's a it's a beast for one too. And so um, yeah before before I you know get into um, more of this stuff, uh, we really appreciate you for coming on brother and um, we'd love to hear about what you got and and what got you into monitors or how, how long have you been doing monitors? All right, thank you for the intro and I really appreciate you guys inviting me on the show today. So, Actually, believe it or not, as far as water monitors go, I've only been uh, breeding and keeping them for about three years. Oh, okay. Um, but my love for water monitors goes way back to when I was quite young. Um, yeah. Loved reptiles. Actually, I was infatuated with snakes, but that was like a, a no-go in my house. I was never going to be allowed to have a snake in that house. So I went lizard shopping. Right. And... Uh, I really wanted this water monitor that I saw because back then you could get wild caught water monitors in any corner pet store. Um, there was yeah. CBB it didn't exist at that point. I mean, we're talking like you know, uh, you know, mid twenty years ago. <laughs> so it was a long time ago. Yeah. But the the pet store owner said, you know, this gets to seven feet, and obviously my parents were like, absolutely not. So I ended up getting a Savannah, <laughs> and um, you know, long story short. It was a bad time in the Savannah era to have them because nobody really knew how to care for them, you know, 24, 25 years ago. Um, yeah. But, yeah, I still to this day remember that first water monitor baby that I saw in the pet store. Um, so a few years ago, I actually had space. I had time. Um, so, like, you know what? I really want to get – I want to get into this, the water monitors. So I got one, did tons of research. And I realized that um, there was a high demand for water monitors, like you just said. So, you know, I think I can, I can jump in on this and really, you know, start a hobby and really enjoy what I'm doing. And um, yeah. so that's basically how I got to where I am three years ago. But when I jumped in kind of head first into the deep end, I bought adult black dragons. I bought an adult black dragon from- Adult um, black dragon. Yeah. So I bought one that originated <laughs> right from it. Corey at Tuchless. Oh, okay. Yeah. And then I knew I was going to try to breed them, so I wanted a completely random bloodline. So I bought an adult female um, that came out of Thailand, wild caught. Look, wow. You know, you know what's crazy? An adult, wild. Caught. <laughs> yeah. When I when I look at your setups, yeah. right, and and then, and then I think about Corey at Tuchless setups. They're identical. I mean, I'm pretty sure you're you're trying to see how he's done it and basically replicated in a way, right? And so when I see your tubs, your giant tubs, I mean, it's like it's kind of how Corey does it, you know. Um, 
those really big Rubbermaid tubs. And yeah, yeah, those are, it's quite, I, I, the way, the way I see it, man, that's a really large drum for that type of big lizard too. Um, I haven't seen well, these yet. Soil. So I, haven't, I haven't seen your, your setups. Um, so I, I do, um, I, I did. So Corey, I, I've been in touch with Corey over the last couple of years, you know, has always, even though he's never got a penny from me, I'll give him a little penny. Always given me, you know, his time out of the kindness of his heart. So, um, just a little pitch for Corey, even though he's not in the business anymore. Yeah. Um, Very nice. But yeah, so one of my things is I wanted to breed them and I was going to give them as much space as I possibly could, which is why I do the big drums like Corey does. Um, I'm not sure how he does his nest boxes, but I got, I have huge nest boxes. My nest boxes are 150 gallon drums. I mean, they're, okay, um, okay. and that has actually been an amazing thing for me to observe because these water monitors are actually really good at tunneling and they actually are building yeah. burrows. Um, I have a video of one that's so deep and you, know, you can't even tell what there's in it and she's not laying. It's just a normal thing. I can reach my entire arm in there and I'm still not at the bottom. It, and um. I didn't really realize that water monitors were that um, into, you know, burrowing like that, but they are. Um, and they have plenty of other places to yeah. hide and climb in here. But they also are burrowing, and that's, it's, you know, that made me really well Yeah, that's a whole, it's a whole mental thing for them, it's I think, what? you know, uh, to, to see, you know, what, what we kind of just uh, box in, right? I, I, I don't know another word to use, but... It's like the people think water monitors really just love right. the water, but really there, there's a whole lot more to their, to their, to their, uh, um, the whole get up, you know, or same thing considered with tree monitors, how a tree monitor wouldn't like, like hides or its own nook and cranny or, or even utilize soil. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, but they do. And I, I think they, they really get a whole, not just a physical stimuli and physique build because they're turning so much soil but man that mental stimuli too where uh yeah, they, they get to essentially complete you know life cycle process and go through the whole thing i mean and like you mentioned before you know 15 20 years ago although some of us were practicing this most of the hobby was not and you'd see water monitors kept with two inches of soil or mm -hmm. two inches of mulch and that was it you know they had a water drum and that, that was it yeah um so yeah man i'm, I'm gr great to see that that's really being used and I, i've seen your video too i think you shoved your whole arm down there just to get an idea on on just how big a burrow should be and then when a lot of people only think about the burrow right but i mean the the rest of the volume of soil to take that takes to support that how much are you using man how many um, tons how many tons? <laughs> I, I don't. I don't have a good number for you, but I mean, it's a 150 gallon tub, and it is densely packed. I mean, I put a layer in, and I pound it down, and I put another in. So it it, it a lot. Of, yeah. like, and it's, it, um, but it's and it's it's moist. I keep it really really moist. Um, there's no water collecting on the bottom of the tub. Like if I were to dig it up, but it's very very moist in there, and they have a lot of little microclimates and get into and I think that's really important for every monitor um, especially water monitors and yet you were going you know how they like to climb they swim and they dig I, I read online somebody described him as an ATV like an all-terrain vehicle and they, it makes so much sense and uh, and so many of these animals yeah. truly are that you can't just put them in something mm -hmm. and, and give them a branch or give them a pond they need everything yeah, e everything, everything. <clears throat> man, yeah. uh, dang monitors. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, I, me, me, me and Alan don't have stuff bigger than three or four feet. That's that's our biggest so far. Yeah. For that same reason too. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, they take a lot more dirt that I have to move, and uh, it just a, a lot more care on that level when you're when you're talking about big animals. So. It kind of limits you as far as um, how many, uh, what you're going to keep, uh, which 
don't get me wrong, can be a great thing, very purpose driven. I think for me, I'm I'm still in that phase where it's like I want to play with all the little things first, and I can fit yeah. this many little things into the size of what it would take for one big <laughs> thing. So <laughs> that's yeah. the way my mind works on it. And um, but you know, I, I've moved into a, a couple like mid size monitors, and there's some some large ones in the future maybe that I would um, downsize because. That's the other thing. You can't take care of everything um, all at yeah. once. So when you have too many mouths to feed, um, you know, and you kind of across the board is what I'm finding. If I were to take on something big right now, um, actually, it probably wouldn't be a good idea for me to, to go that large. But doesn't mean I'm not always looking at it and watching. And so, uh, you know, I, I just looked up when you said 150-gallon Rubbermaid. I'm looking up, what's the size of those again? You know, yeah. Can I pull that it's, off? Uh, <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a jacuzzi. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> which is awesome. Which is absolutely awesome, you know. Um, the, the, and back to water monitors burrowing, um, I saw one in Sri Lanka going into basically an, a dirt embankment right off the side of a waterway. And it had already gone in there, you know, up to its... Uh, uh, rear legs and i saw it when it's basically coming back out moving dirt and going back in there again and uh so that one it was across the water away from where i was so maybe about i don't know 12 feet away so we're watching it from the other side and uh it's just digging away even though we're right there it could care less about us um you know there's another one next to me under a palm frond that i didn't even notice but um, yeah, I don't know why it took me by surprise. I saw some on the bank, saw some in the water, but then to see one just digging a burrow, and we're talking, it was maybe three feet up from the water and about seven feet down from the top of where you would like stand on top of this embankment. So, I mean, there was a good amount of dirt in there and all that dirt holding that, that burrow, holding that structure it was making. So, uh, yeah, definitely, there's, uh, there's a lot going into that and giving them a lot of dirt you know to cover that size of animal too just for the the, the whole process of um, going in there turning around laying eggs covering that hole back up um yeah man <laughs> i don't some want to of our, that, that much right now <laughs> yeah, for some of our listeners uh um zach uh, how much time and effort do you put in there either daily or weekly and then how, you know uh, what would you recommend as far as the effort that you kind of put into build a relationship because i think out of many of the things that we can discuss taming and getting a docile animal or you know having a quality pet that is rewarding is on many people's minds at the top of their yeah. radar and so how would how would you describe your normal get up as far as effort and work and things like that daily so okay um effort and work that's kind of a loaded question, right? Because I mean, as you guys know, are we ever really done? Um, uh, but <laughs> I so oh, no. really in, on my day to day, and I kind of do this every single day in the system. I get up and um, I, I feed them every morning. I'm a big morning feeder, um, and I feed before I go to the office. And um, that, you know, so let's say 45 minutes in the morning before I go to work, and that's really really just getting the food ready, feeding them. Um, I'll spot feed and hand and tongue feed the ones that I'm able to just trying to get as much interaction as I can in, in the amount of time that I have in a day. I mean, the day is only so long. I have a full-time job, family, all that, all that stuff. So 45, yeah. it's really, it's really a career. go around and check the cages um, thoroughly at least once. And if I see something that needs to be cleaned, I'll clean it up. Um, if I see something needs to be fixed, I'll fix it. I'll swap out bulbs. So it's kind of ad hoc in the evening. And it's random amounts of time. I'll go around. If somebody will let me touch them, I'll touch them. If I can take them out, I'll take them out. I don't force any interactions with them. But I do make sure that they see me all day. Um, and I actually have a person who comes and, and works for me a few hours a week. So they see, they see her. Oh, nice. You know, a few times a week too, not just me. My family's involved. I, I, you may have seen some videos on my page of, you know, my kids holding the baby water monitors, trying to just get them used to anything yeah. that people can throw at them. 
so that's really my uh, basic A. I'm always building enclosures. I'm always updating enclosures. And that's, oh my gosh, that is, as you guys maybe will know, is incredibly <laughs> time consuming and then very random how long it takes. It just depends on what you're doing. Um, but I really enjoy doing it. Um, I like carpentry, so it's a lot of fun. How many animals are you having? So right, right now? now, I have five adult Asian board monitors. And I've got no babies. Um, yeah. One thing about the taming that I want to touch on, and it kind of throws people off, and I think we could have a really good discussion about it. Um, I put up a lot of videos about how I how I tame the babies. You know, I let them, I get them out of the cage as gentle as possible, put them in the water. Same thing that everybody does. Um, one thing that surprises people as the monitors age and water monitors age very fast. You got to move them into another enclosure. You may put them in two, three enclosures before you get to that that adult enclosure. And um, everybody has setbacks, temperament wise. And uh, I see it all the time. Yeah. But one thing that I do, and probably because I'm a breeder, my adult animals do not have their enclosure. It's like it's like musical chairs. Even. Yeah, and, and, same, um, same here. I'm sorry, what? Same here. Same here. Um, and then I don't have any setbacks because I do that. Um, they're used to, you know, five different enclosures. doesn't matter where they are. They've got the same personality. Yeah, okay, I get what you're saying. And um, I kind of have this cut yeah. and paste that I send people whenever they reach out to me. They're like, you know, I'm afraid that my animal's going to, going to regress from this sweet little golden retriever that I have that sits on the ottoman next to me while I watch Netflix or something. What I always tell them to do is when you have your enclosure, the final enclosure should be big enough that you can get in for a water monitor. You know, no, no question. Get in, get in the enclosure with this animal before he moves in or she moves in and do that for 10 minutes a day for the first week. And then the following week, you know, do it a couple times the following week, maybe leave them there for 30, 45 minutes by himself. And then the third week, you just keep moving down these iterations until it's basically its second home. And then you move it in. And I've seen a lot of people have a lot of luck with this um, as far as keeping that temperament that they don't want to lose. So that's my biggest piece of taming advice because the babies are kind of, um, you're kind of easy. You know, you don't, you don't grab them, but uh, you can use food to lower them onto your yeah. arm or just put your hands in the enclosure for a few minutes every single day. They're going to get used to you. They're going to they're gonna eventually come to you. Um, but to me, the biggest problem is that cage transition. Good to know. Yeah, I need to uh, do something similar. Actually, it was uh, the plan for today was to move some animals i'm just swapping enclosures so um there's uh some savannas and sand monitors and uh, blue tails and they're just all kind of getting a cage swap so um for kind of the same reason change it up um uh give them something new i'm starting to see um well for a couple different reasons um a little bit of maybe food aggression that i'm not used to seeing at that level um and the way I've done it in the past, instead of separating them, sometimes I'll just take one of the animals, usually I'll take the, the female, actually, and put her in the new cage, feed her in there, and then uh, do that for a couple days, and then take the male, who's usually in like a holding cage at that point, and then put him mm. in, and a lot of times it just erases that, that level of uh, food aggression that I'm seeing. It kind of resets them in a bit, and... Um, um, I don't know if that's something, but hearing you talk about it, I didn't, I didn't really think about it. I just noticed that it worked in the past. Um, but if I did that more frequently, maybe I wouldn't see it at all. So, um, yeah, I, li I like that. That's something I could, uh, I, you know, I do it with the big monitors cause they're, they're bigger, but I'm thinking maybe trying it with the small monitors too, but they don't do as much damage, you know, <laughs> if, if one of them were to just, you know, grab the, the, the head or grab an arm of the other one and say, hey, that's my whatever, you know. Um, 
so I don't pay much attention to it. But uh, I wonder what that would. I wonder what it, behaviors I would notice change after doing that with the small guys. So. But sorry to interrupt. It was just All right. keep going. No, that, that was that was great. But um, personally, I think people notice a lot because I. One, I've never had a food aggression issue, per se. I can spot feed as much as possible because then I can control exactly who's getting mm -hmm. what. Um, but what water monitors do have is nest box aggression. Yeah. And it is bad. Yeah. It is, you My know, monitor's too. Minimal. They're, they're, my sorry. monitor's too, really bad. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, what I do with the females, if I want to put... Um, one of my other females, and for a reason, maybe I just want to leave the male there. I'll move the uh, nest box out and put her in a cage with another um, nest box. And I could immediately put another lizard in with her, maybe within a day or two. And it's completely, that aggression is completely gone because you completely removed her from the territory. Yeah. Um, and what I've heard is that if you have a nest box you can remove, I can't move mine because mine weighs probably, you know, well over a thousand pounds. Yeah. But if you can remove it, I've heard you can leave the female in that enclosure and that nest box aggression will uh, disappear at that time as well. Okay. Simply removing only the box. Interesting. I, I haven't seen that personally with, with mine, but uh, I've heard Kai talk about it a little bit um, and a few other people, but not something I've, I've noticed. Um, yeah with the nest boxes but i use the nest boxes in a lot of the smaller stuff so maybe that's some of it too i can't move you know all the substrate for uh <laughs> for the sand monitor or whatever um oh, that, that is actually I'm, I'm in a position right now where like even after we record today i'm going to just change some stuff up and get on to um feeding animals differently right now they've kind of been on a real slim diet through the summer and then uh, it's still warm here, but I was just changing things up, giving them some new perspective, new things to do, and going to change up what I'm feeding them a little bit going into uh, the rest of August into September and then into the fall. Um, so it's a good time to have this conversation because you're getting me thinking about some of these things that, you know, uh, I get into a routine of doing things sometimes. So... <clears throat> Um, I start seeing the animals act a little differently, and of course, I'm not doing anything wrong. So <laughs> it's good to have this. Uh, you know, I was thinking, hey Kai, let's uh, let's record um, afterwards. After when it gets hot in the afternoon, and he's like, oh no, he has to come on earlier. Actually, I think this is gonna work out good for me. It's gonna give me some more work to do, but <laughs> yeah, but that's all good. So keep, uh, it's, uh, keep talking, Zach. I'm gonna I'm gonna take some notes here. <laughs> okay yeah so switching it up um has other benefits too i believe because you guys may have noticed with your monitors but i've certainly noticed with my water monitors if i walk into their cage and i move anything or if there's like a little test dig and i brush the dirt back over it you know just to flatten it out or something yeah. i'll come back and um or i'll look at all my cameras and they are investigating anything that i've touched anything that I've moved. And so as far as getting their, keeping their curiosity peaked, I'm real big on rearranging stuff, just switching it up on them. Um, it's really good for that brain. It's very complex. They're so smart. You don't want to get bored. Um, and getting bored can be a cause where they start picking on each other. They don't have anything else to do. So they're like, oh, what do I do if I, you know, grab, grab my buddy's tail or something? We've been, we've been so busy lately and so, Get, getting you on and i was just like you know what I, we gotta find a guest that was gonna hit the spot for our people just because like it's like i said again the water monitors are are a big hit with everybody and we really haven't done a water monitor specific episode and it's mostly because uh honestly they're not really on our radar just because you know they're they're so big sure they're great and everything is cool but it's just not our cup of tea essentially you know what i mean um but yeah man yeah. It's, I'm, you I'm got, glad you're, you're doing it right too yeah yeah because a lot of people jump in without really knowing all the all the odds and ends that it comes with it you know um and i'm glad that you're able to teach that stuff on on your own page and i see you posting on some of the groups and, and things like that do you do you have do you have eggs cooking now i do 
actually. Um, nice. I have, I believe, 23 normal water monitor eggs and 14 black dragon eggs. Oh, wow. That's a whole, that's baby a whole setups. zoo. Sorry, what? <laughs> I said baby setups. That's a that's a lot of baby setups. <laughs> it is a lot of baby setups. Um, and I, I build my own. I keep all my babies in six foot by two foot by two foot enclosures. So I'll put you know a handful of them in each. Yeah, very very nice. Yeah. Um, and are you are you what are you doing for water for the babies? I just change it out daily. So I just have like kind of. Uh, a small tote and I just go in there in the morning I'll dump it down the toilet and then refill it and put it back in but that's a good question about the water changing and um, this comes up online all the time it's do you put a filter on your you know multiple hundred gallon water monitor pond or do you just drain it every day and you know waste tons of water I am pro filter all day um, I recommend it to everybody I do about a full water change once every few weeks during the summer and then I'll do more water changes in the winter but I'll only do about half of the volume and that's because in the summer my water is hot so I'm not going to freeze my, my animals but in the winter the water is so cold I can only do 50% water changes at a time without really chilling them down where where are you at, Zach? I don't. I'm know in Virginia. Oh, okay. 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 So summers are very very hot. Winters can be quite cold. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I'm pro filter, and I always tell people get the biggest garden pond filter you can get, and get the biggest pump that that filter can handle, and you yeah. and you're good to go. Um, and and you're are you uh getting backed up by debris and fecal matter at all or you it's so yeah um that happens because the good thing about water monitors is they use the bathroom in the pond you know 90 percent of the time it's just what they do and so the filter does a lot of the cage maintenance for you which is why i say go get the filter get the biggest filter don't skimp on it it's going to be a saving grace but anyway, when I buy um, pumps for these filters, giant pumps, um, they're made for outdoor ponds, and they actually have baskets in them that you can remove that catches all the oh, debris. Nice. What it is, it's meant to catch leaves from like a koi pond or something. Yeah. And so that's what I use, um, and it catches skin. Shed skin would clog it up really bad. Um, it collects uh, any mulch or dirt that they kick in there. And then big chunks of maybe there's a little fur here and there that I don't want getting in my motor. And I just pull that basket out, shake it out, hose it off, put it right back in, and we're good to go. Very good. Um, One thing I also catch is, uh, so I feed my animals a lot of quail eggs. I raise my own quail. Mm -hmm. So I have one quail, tons of quail eggs. And I uh, I give them either regular quail eggs all the time, or I give them, um, fertilized embryo eggs almost like basically lizard blue yeah um their quail eggs have a membrane in them that is so strong that they actually pass this membrane it's completely empty of the nutrients um but it passes if you ever had to eat a quail egg without hard boiling it you actually have to cut it because you can't get broken by a little crack um, I don't know if that's a common thing people see, but it, 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 it for for me it is. I always see these little. They're basically like a deflated ping pong yeah. ball. That's what it kind of looks like, and they're just you know they're latex like. Yeah. So uh, I just I just pick them up. I mean I, I observe them because they can also eat their own eggs, and then they pass those too. But those are typically like oval like, and then they're they're shriveled. Um, but um. The, the quail eggs though yeah I, I get that I get that a lot pretty often and I, I remember when I was a kid like 16 with my first little water monitor right um, and th- I remember feeding the quail egg that, that that we got from the store and then I remember seeing that going to kingsnake.com and on the forum asking hey did my lizard lay an egg 
And they're like, no, it's just the membrane of the egg, you know? Oh, yeah. <laughs> or yeah. I, I kind of had the same kind of thing. Um, you know, meanwhile, I've been breeding water monitors for, you know, a couple of years now. And I see this egg or, or a membrane and I go, why didn't she digest that? Am, am I like, are my parameters off? Is my hot spot not hot enough? I'm like, what am I doing wrong? Yeah. Cause you know, they've got stomachs that are supposed to be able to digest anything, but that quail right, egg right. membrane can make it through. It's crazy. Yeah. 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 If they're um, digesting teeth and bone, <laughs> but not the membrane, it's so <laughs> weird. Right. <laughs> I know. Uh, about quail, what kind of quail are you raising? And I, I asked cause, uh, Jeff Easter, uh, we've been messaging back and forth about keeping uh, quail. So he's yeah. trying to give me all the, all the info on, uh, raising my own quail. It's something I definitely want to do. It's just time to set that up. And then, you know, you know what, Alan, What's people, that? people say that if you just set them up, have the food, they'll lay an egg or two a day. I mean, it's that, that prolific, right? Is that, that is a, correct. A, a day, yeah. a day, man, that's, that's a lot. And you just got to feed them and make sure they got water in their little outdoor pen but yeah man zach how do you have so yours? i i keep mine outside i have a, a, a pin outside so i keep them in kind of a run um there is a coop out there but they're ground birds they don't use the coop but uh I, I, i've seen jeff easter's pictures so that's really funny you bring him up um i actually really like the quail you know i, I got them i was like you know i'm gonna give it a shot and see what I've fallen in love with them. Like they're just little tiny birds. Like, no, I really, I really enjoy having them. Um, they're extremely hardy. They can handle obscenely low temperatures and be just fine as adults. Um, and, and they can do hot temperatures too, as long as they have water. Like Kai said, um, mm -hmm. the ones that I raise are um, Cortunix, which is you know your your general big quail that's bred for meat and bred for eggs. So okay. it's, it's a, it's a really fun operation and I'm still shocked at how much I actually enjoy, uh, raising and breeding the quail. I never thought I would like it. Um, but it's, it's interesting. So actually, so today I put, um, I put 42 week old quail in the freezer and I had 42 quail hatch. And so I just, that's kind of my rotation I have going on here. Wait, wait, 42 um, eggs eggs laid this month? No, so what were you saying? Um, I had 42 that had grown to the size where I, I call and I freeze. Oh, okay. I get, a, I get, I get about a dozen eggs a day, and I, I, wait, I keep them out until I have about 60, and then I put all 60 in the incubator at once so I don't have to open and close the incubator too many times. And then out of that 60, I get about 40 to 45 that will hatch about 16 days later. Okay. But it's actually pretty cool. So I don't even, I don't throw away the eggs that don't hatch for whatever reason. Because normally there's an embryo in there. It just probably died in the last couple of days of incubation or it just couldn't break through the shell. Very common. Those go straight into the freezer. And then I'll feed those off to my lizards um, as little embryo egg treats. Very nice. Yeah, that's uh. I like this a those, lot. I just got. Those are things that we we uh, I myself find as a, a whole package deal within that little quail egg, and it's a bite-sized thing, you know, comparable to a fertile duck or chicken egg, which is quite big. It kind of is a mess, but they could just pop back these quail eggs, and you know, uh, it's calcium. It has the yolk in it typically where that's an extra source of, of fat for egg development and usage, right? Um, and then the nutrients that it's at, the actual bird inside, along with the juices too. I mean, it's just, a, yeah, my, my guys love it. I, I spend a little bit, as far as the most pricey food that I have, um, the quail eggs are, are up there. Um, as Cause I, 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 I'm pretty much paying full price from a market that has fertile quail eggs. I typically would have bought from Adam, um, but the, the the shipping is just so much from his from his side to over here that it's almost about the same what I'm paying for at the market. 
Um, but yeah, I, I buy them. I let them sit for a few days on the counter at 80 degrees or I'll throw them in the incubator. And when one starts to hatch, I take them, the rest of them, and I freeze them. So that way I know they're right about the size. And um, yeah, man, they're, they're great. They're great quick, and it's a pretty clean meal um, on, on when they use it. Yeah, it's comparable to like a really, again, a cut up chick or something like that that's got a lot of mess in it. it's really really efficient um mm. yeah i really want to do this i just got to find the the time to get it up and running and uh gotta you know check into those child labor laws make sure i can uh, <laughs> force my kids to yeah. <laughs> just ask your kids hey do you guys want some birds for yourself yeah, well, you gotta take yeah. care of them <laughs> yeah well, i'll tell you one thing about the quail eggs and your children so the first time I, when I bought my quail, the guy gave me three dozen eggs to eat. So I hard boiled them, I peeled them, and my kids wouldn't stop eating them. They are absolutely <laughs> delicious. Um, yeah, yeah, so they're a nice little treat for yourself as well. Yeah. All mine go to the lizards. Okay. Now I got this. I got this idea. When we have these conversations, you know, you're talking about draining water and this, and I envision this. Uh, uh, I have everything in a warehouse right now, but I envision this building, you know, on the property that um, it's kind of a, a descending property off the the back edge. Uh, so you know, have this somewhat subterranean building built into the uh, embankment so i can control temps a little better i got in my this is my head in my head i got my solar panels i got my indoor outdoor cages i have the uh the water that like runs off off the back and uh into basically a garden area where i'm growing food quail set up got the bug room all that one day when i when, You'll be when I off the up, land <laughs> Yeah. I know with lizards. <laughs> uh, I hope we don't get into any hard times. It'll well, be uh, some well, you'll have to share the quail. <laughs> so, as, as far as uh, your uh, like the, your larger salvators, are you majority saving quail stock, growing them up to an adequate size, saving those, or do you only use mostly eggs and small so, chicks? I try to keep a good combination. I actually save any eggs out of the incubator deliberately just for feeding. All these failed hatchings, um, which I, you know, I'm getting about 20 of those a week. I don't, I don't give them a whole lot. And then I raise most of the babies up to two weeks. Um, a, Corton, a Cortinex quail is considered fully grown about eight, to, I mean, six to eight weeks. So a two-week-old bird is pretty big, um, which is actually really good because they hatch about. It's, it's probably bigger than that. I mean, it's they're bigger than the chicks that you buy from oh, the store really? by far, like or a chick from a grower or whatever. Oh, okay. Um, so yeah, two weeks is big enough that you know I can give them one a day if I were to feed, if I you know one a meal, and it's a good it's a good sized meal for them, and they're so dense, they're so meaty. Quail is just one of the best foods. Yeah. But I am going to have to start sucking up on babies for when these uh, water monitors start to hatch here in mm, September, October. Yeah. I will have to have a lot of babies left. and But the babies are easy because I don't have to raise them. You know, it's just... <laughs> the, the big ones I have to actually take care of. I have to raise and feed. Yeah. And they have to be in a brooder under a heat lamp. So they're they're... They're a little bit of work, but the amount of money I'm saving okay. versus buying all the food I need from an online vendor is, is huge. Yeah. Yeah. That's where I'm, that's what I'm considering and, uh, and where I'm at as well, both with, um, hopefully starting quail. I still get chicks from a guy. It's, um, for a pretty good price. Uh, but almost switching out of rodents completely except for the the snake part of my operation um, same yeah. same yeah yes yeah, you use so, a lot of rodents um, i'm actually glad you brought that up i used to feed i used to have a decent amount of rodents in the diet it was a combination of fish quail and rodents 
Um, and my, I could tell my lizards were not, they just weren't that healthy. As, they, were, they were healthy, don't get me wrong, because, you know, they were breeding and living a good life. They were not where I wanted them to be. Um, so I haven't fed in a healthy you mean sorry, lean, lean and fit wise? As far as being lean, as and, far fit, as being yeah. lean and fit, and, um, you mean? And you know, there's a lot of concerns with reproduction if your females aren't in tip top shape. I haven't fed a rodent to an adult water monitor in 2022. Um, I just don't do it anymore. It, it's a, oh, it's wow. only fish, yeah. quail, or quail eggs. And I and I mix I mix that variety up, and it's whole fish. Um, no fillets. Yeah. If and if I were to be a fillet, I would... and what 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 kind of safe what kind of safe fish out there are you using? Because you know there's some fish that have the th- uh, what is it thiamine thi- 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 yeah. right? So I use I use catfish. Yeah. Um, okay. Which I haven't seen anything okay. online of the species of catfish that I feed being being a thiamine's concern. Um, and I certainly don't feed them solely fish, but fish is very important part of their diet to me because, um, you know, if you look at any picture of a water monitor eating, and if you do the research, there's a lot of papers out of Thailand, fish is the number two um, staple in their diet. Number one being crustaceans. Mm-hmm. And I don't have a good source of crustacean. Oh, wow. um, unfortunately, I, I, yeah. yeah. You ever try using? So you ever I try have, using crawfish? Um, somebody gave me a big, like fifty pound bag of crawfish, and so I fed them off, and, and the animals yeah. loved them. I just haven't really found a good yeah. source for it. I would love to have one because yeah. it is yeah. it's just a pivotal part of their diet. Um, at least out of the, the Thailand area where I yeah, that, that, I, that I find. From. Yeah. So I go to the. I don't know if you have a bunch of uh, like Asian markets where you live, but. Where I am, you know, there's quite a few Asian communities, and so there's a fair amount of, you know, seafood markets and pretty big markets like that where you know, it's not just the typical, like, uh, I don't know, uh, Bonds or Albertsons or things like that, right? It's a, quite, uh, quite a selection. And so I buy maybe a good five to ten pounds to last me for a, at least several weeks. Um, and then, you know, I switch off and on, but... I utilize the crawfish a lot uh, as part of their diet. When I, you know, give them a tray of a few selections to choose from, they typically always go for the crabs and crawfish first. It's, you know, it can be the head. It can be a, a, a non-desirable part of the crawfish, like the claw, compared to next to a chick or something like that or a rodent. They'd prefer to go for mm the crustaceans all the time so if you're able to get some because sometimes i pay out you know um uh, pretty expensive to get louisiana crawfish the company to ship me you know five pounds and so it costs about 60 70 bucks which is isn't really cost effective at all but when i go to the asian markets it's really five six bucks for per pound so you're only spending you know maybe half the price for what i typically would get um, and you know, they store really well when you freeze them and things like that. And, uh, I find like, like you mentioned, um, keeping them lean and fit and then going into reproduction is uh, a lot better than them being super hefty. And, you know, then they you know, go through the process and then they look extremely uncomfortable, you know, and then I'm scared for them when they go through that, the pause on food and then. You know, just uh, just the whole mm. beginning stages of reproduction. Um, so for me, as far as this year, I think February. Um, once I ran out of rodents, I didn't order anymore. So I just stuck with the crawfish. I use smelt fish. Um, I have crabs coming, and the quail, the quail eggs as well. Um, and then I also use I also use white shrimp. Um, and that's like my standard diet for the mangroves. I don't really use a whole lot else other than, um, you know, a couple random bugs here and there. But other than that, it's it's uh, quail, fish, seafood, and uh, chicks. And, that, and that's, that's really it, you know. 
Mm. Yeah, so it's, I'm glad you said that because I would assume that a really large monitor would need much more than than just quail, right? But but if you're able to do it and get them going reproductively with fair fair egg size, clutch sizes, things like that, and to have those babies hatch very well, man, I, I'm I'm all for the whole leaving rodents out of the diet so much, you know, just just because it's 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 a, it's hefty on them when they get so much and sometimes they want it um i i, I know it because I, I hold it up and they hit it pretty pretty vigorously but man they, they can they can have something just as good but leaner and they 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 still have been doing quite well for me um as far as laying but also again I, sure breeding and laying is great but the longevity of these animals lies is what I kind of want to get to. And I'd rather, you know, I'd rather not pump them full of rodents just because I think that's what's going to produce and rather have them live longer so there's more chances of them producing more clutches later on. Um, and so, yeah, me, I get them down to a very lean fit where there's really no drag on the belly or touching the floor or anything like that, you know. When you hold them up, they're, they're quite almost they look skinny if this mm -hmm. they're just not, you know they have a, a thick tail base good good muscle tone in the arms and Absolutely. legs and, and, that, and that skin flat. is that what you're going I, for I like as well? to always unless they're gravid i want the skin yeah. flap going down their yeah. side you know very visible um that's one of the big signs i look for and and the thick but keeping that thick tail base you, want, you know, especially during reproductive times, that tail base, they can deplete that, you know, if they don't have enough fat in their diet and they just need energy to get those eggs eggs produced. But uh, I did want to touch on your, your clutch size, you know, talking about, I guess, rodents versus quail. So um, I really got onto this no rodent thing because my, my, my main female, she'll lay eggs, she'll lay a clutch every three months. Whether she's with a male or not, it's just it's just the parameters I keep my my enclosures at. Um, but last fall, she absorbed a batch of eggs, and I wasn't exactly sure why. Um, and so I took her completely out of the breeding because I wanted to make sure everything was right. You know, sure enough, three three months later, she laid a clutch, a very small clutch, five or six eggs of slugs. Um, I still didn't put a male in her with her. Three months later, she laid a clutch of slugs that was, uh, I want to say it was 11 eggs. Uh, 11 were slugs, one was good. So probably a partho egg. Which is in my incubator, and that was, you know, it's puffing up. It's going to hatch yeah. here in another few months. So like, okay, I'm going to breed her now. Meanwhile, she hasn't had a rodent all 2022. Put the male in with her. They bred for about... Um, uh, maybe two days straight, she laid a clutch of 19 eggs, 14 of which were fertile. So, and that's just pure anecdotal, you know, nice. one time Great. this happened, but that's by far her biggest clutch. Yeah. So when she was really healthy, she was doing about um, 14 to 16 egg clutches. Then we had our issues, got her back to a healthy, healthy weight. Yeah. Um, she laid that 19 egg clutch. Um, I don't know if there's anything to it, but I'm going to keep going down the path that I am with the quail and the eggs. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is either. So at one point I was doing just feeding anything, which whatever, and kind of just keeping them like, you know, what they say is you kind of have to pound them a little bit, right, to get them to go. Well, I'm not actually really pounding anymore. I'm actually learning now that um, the right consistency and the right volume of food with calcium and the protein ratio is enough. So I don't have to continually, you know, stuff them till they're full every single time. I have a volume of food, which typically fits in my hand for my monitors, right? So it fits in my palm and it's a, a balance between the quail and the fish and the, the crustaceans and that's that's really it lately right um i have been using rodents a lot less and if it is anything it's after she's laid then i'll give her something and that'll that'll 
give her a, a pet back up and step, you know what I mean? But now for my monitors, and I'm not sure if it's just the mangroves or it's a lot of monitors, but I kind of let them get to that, that lean part or more so of just feeding them enough. So then when I do feed them a bit heavier, then it goes, it triggers the cycle, you know, and then they're, they're more freely into the whole process. Um, and that's just how, how I've been doing it lately for the last good year or so of practicing less rodents, more of a, a the, the balanced diet. And then not so much, like I'm not feeding every day and I'm not making sure they're full every day. Not at all. It's mm -hmm. maybe just enough food every other day and, and some, yeah. something like that. Three or four times a week, that's all they're going to get. Then, really. And they've been still doing well and with good clutches. And the whole process on them, like just having them go through vitiligenesis and and that part where they look miserable, right? They're puffed up. They, <laughs> they look they look terrible. They almost look lethargic and sick. But we now know this as this stage where they're not not eating, right? And um, I've had a, I've had actually an animal die because it went from one clutch. And then I just kept on feeding the hell out of it, right? And then I thought, okay, this would be the, the, the idea for your next clutch. Maybe we can get this going. And really that actually killed her because yeah. um, she ended up with just so much waste in her gut, you know, just just blocked up from being so full on top of the rodents that I was using. And, you know, from there, ever since that female passed from that situation, just being bloated, really gassy around around the egg development part, um, or sorry, the, the yolk and ovum part, that it was just uh, devastating for me. But it was really eye-opening for the rest of my animals and, and how I'm going to be working them just because I know, okay, I can't, I can't be stuffing all these other, other girls too, you know. Um, and so that's how I've been trying to go about about my diet and I, I think that's I, a great approach and everybody. it's very similar to what I'm, I'm starting to do. Like I, I feed um, about every other day, just like you do, my, my breeding females. Uh, my males, I don't feed every other day. But then I, when the females are about a week and a half, I know they're going to start cycling. I will give them maybe a little bit more volume, but I do it. I, I spread it out over every day. And they're getting something on their belly every day, but it's not necessarily yeah. going to be a lot more than normal. Yeah. Um, and the addition may be, it may be more embryo eggs, something that's just incredibly full of nutrients and healthy for them. It's not going to be like, okay, I'm going to give you a quail seven days a week. Right. You know, it may be, you know, a quail one day, embryo eggs the next day, right. and then right. something every day. And it, and it really gets them going. Switch it up a bit. Yeah. Yeah, ideally, I, I tend to go for a lot of my adult uh, stuff is every uh, every two days um, for feeding uh, approximately when I'm trying to uh, push them. And then maybe as I'm really getting into the season, maybe every day, but it's, it's very similar. It's um, just enough. I'm not trying to, you know, just let them gorge. A lot of times they're still sniffing around to see if there's food in the cage somewhere rather than just becoming these fat sausages under the basking lamp, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that, that's what I like to go for. And you, you had already mentioned the skin flap, uh, the tail base. Uh, and then bringing them down, I don't, this is for me, I like to see the, uh, like right now, the tail bases just barely start to indent, just try to tap into that just a bit. And uh, just so I can see it, and as soon as I see it, that's what I try to aim for, I guess, the decline yeah. with my animals through right. the height of the summer. Just because... For me, it, it's 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 hard for me to keep up with the the temp requirements that they need because sometimes there might be days where I just have to shut everything off. So I don't think it's fair to the animals to try to put them into any kind of cycle at that point. And um, when it there's not a lot of control there, where I just I'm at the mercy of the elements. But so that's the new plan anyway that I'm trying to establish in the collection. Bring them down right to about there and now start um, feeding them more on a regular basis, but not to get, you know, super fat, anything close to that. Um, and then using, you know, what I can to kind of 
diversify a little bit, including including the uh, the older dubia, the the bigger roaches. You know, throw one in here or there. Usually, I'll do that first when they're hungry, because they'll actually chase them down. If I do it afterwards, then I just have roaches in the cage. Uh, but um, you know, because I'm I'm feeding them something different than whatever their other food sources are consuming or eating. Um, so trying within my own. I guess uh, availability right now because it's basically rodents, um, uh, chicks, bugs, and then a few miscellaneous items that I'll try to throw in there. Like I'll pick up uh, frog legs or you know just something something different to, to throw in there. But I agree. I think overall it um, translates into better clutches. I think it it also translates into better animals because they don't get in a, this rhythm of just eating the same thing every day, kind of the same behaviors every day. Um, maybe it's because I got to kind of feed them, you know, I got to cut up frog legs for a lot of them, got to feed them a little different. They approach it different. Uh, the yeah. way their behaviors are different. So yeah, I think that's good for them too, mentally. Yeah. I mean, it, it's really great that you were, were actually talking about this with, with water monitors because man, when I, when I see some breeders out there or, I see, you know, the physical animals, right? It's like, man, that, that female laid, but she looks really big still, you know, it's like, oh man, that's just, that's just sitting fat there, you know? Um, and so I didn't want to, I didn't want my animals to, to, to look like that. Or uh, obviously when we're looking at wild animals too, I mean, even the ones that are laying, they, they kind of, the only part that's big on these gravid females that you're seeing pictures of in the wild, it's just the belly. And then when they lay, it's, it's just deflated. And mm -hmm. so the animals is back to, back to a very, very narrow look. And at the same time, you know, when you're looking at these documentaries of monitor lizards that have gone through the process and when they come back up, man, they look almost anorexic a little bit, you know? Yeah. Um, and so that's, that would be a typical normal there for, for them and what they can handle. And that's what I've actually gone through with mine too, where these, these mangrove monitors that are about three feet they're not huge but when i'm looking at them after they've laid there's a definite i can see that you've laid you know there's you're deflated now um right speaking of that i actually have to check check some nest bins later later tonight so um you know i got a, there was a an animal that i had um and she went down for a couple days didn't just ignored whatever i was doing on, on top as far as leaving food and uh, now she came back up and was eating pretty vigorously last night. So I'm, I'm hoping that she laid something. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I kind of have a good handful of females now where there's, you know, there's a lot going on and I want to develop a, a new, not new, but more so just develop better practices for them. Um, that way, even if like when we're really busy, man, you're just not a, you're just not a monitor that I'm stuffing and stuffing and stuffing. And then one day I come into it and you're, you're, you're killed over or I wasn't paying attention to how healthy you were or not, you know? Um, so yeah, me keeping them lean gives me a, a better, a better feeling about how everything goes, you know? Mm -hmm. You know, Zach, um, touching on your, your setups, uh, there's a couple things I wanted to ask, but first, um, how are you heating your, your nesting areas. The How tons. Do you that? <laughs> yeah. Oh wait, that's I, I, the audio what do you say? went out. For... How, How do you, you How do you Oh, heat, heat them? Yes. yes, How do you yes heat I them? do. You don't? I, I I use multiple different methods to heat them. Um, so my big enclosure that I um, that I have my biggest breeding female in. I actually have underfloor heating in half of that enclosure, um, and I keep that heating element at nice. 83 degrees. The bottom of that nest box is okay. about 83 degrees, um, so they always they dig down and they, um, you know, they lay right on the bottom of that nest box where the the heating elements are. And so that's how I do that one. So I don't actually have anything attached to it. It's just sitting on that place that's super warm on the ground. Um, my other ones, I actually use pretty big heat tape, maybe 13-inch wide heat tape. 
and I have it attached to the side of of the lay box where the animal can't get like up against a wall. Um, and then I heat I heat from the side mm -hmm. one of those ones. And I don't have a thermostat on those because they they don't have enough watts to get very hot. I mean, you can walk up and lay your hand on it all day long, yeah. but it is. And, yeah. and your amount of soil too, right? Your amount of soil absorbs that extra heat that you have coming from it. That's what people ask me all the time is, do you put a thermostat on my on your cane mats or you put your thermostat on your heat pads that you used to heat up, right? And I tell them, no, I just let it run. Sure, the area right next to the, the wall, the heat mat and the dirt is going to be hot, but there's much more space mm -hmm. for them to then find. You know, right. but let's say if you were to put the your desired temperature is about 85, 83, 86 degrees, right? So if you make that spot right next to the heat pad and the wall 85 degrees, it's actually not going to transfer much to the rest of the soil. So what you want that soil temperature to be at the wall is about 100, 90 something, 100 degrees. So that way the rest of the soil, it'll it'll transfer through and get cooler as you move away from the wall. Um, so, you know, people that are asking, that's why, that's why we don't really use for that much soil. You don't really need a whole lot. You know? mm -hmm. Thanks for bringing that up, man. Yeah, no, I, I, I totally agree with you. Having that, um, that, um, how, what's the, that range of temperatures, you know, and it intrigues them that way they can pick the exact temperature and humidity they want. Um, and that's kind of why, speaking of humidity, I said my, the bottom of mine aren't soggy, but the soil down there is definitely more wet than, you know, the soil that's only three inches below the surface. And then the surface can be pretty darn dry. But as yeah. soon as you dig down half an inch, you're getting dark, damp soil. Um, and I, I, weekly, I put a lot of moisture back into my nest boxes. And what are you using as far as a substrate in your nest box? Because I know when sometimes certain mixtures, especially of dirt or certain uh, soils that some people use, unless you're turning it constantly down there with something that size, that's a lot of work. Um, it can get kind of rotten, you know, that, that stank coming out of it sometimes uh, where, <laughs> you know, you don't want to be and your animals probably don't want to be either. So how are you um, or what are you using? So um, in my early days, I actually experienced that. I was putting too much water and um, I was digging, digging around to see how good it could hold a grub. It hadn't been used yet and it, it had produced quite a stink organic material. I'm not sure exactly what it was. I was like, okay, so that's, that is too much water. But I found that if you don't let water pool down there, um, the lizards, at least in my experience, they do the turnover for me. Um, mm -hmm. They're constantly burrowing. They're getting down to those really humid areas and just relaxing sometimes. Um, I think sometimes it's even maybe midday during the summer, it may be a little bit cooler in their burrow because it's held on to that nighttime air um, for they'll be down there. So their daily activities are kind of turning it. I've never, since that initial time, I haven't been digging up eggs or, or playing with the nest boxes and, and been hit with an odor um, yeah. since that one time. But a good thing about using the Rubbermaids, if it was ever an issue, they have ports in the bottom that I could just open up and start to let air seep into the bottom areas and uh, right. eliminate any kind of gas off the gas off. Very nice. Yeah, I think, uh, was it Robert Fox that said he drills holes into the bottom of his nest boxes to help kind of facilitate some of that exchange to let them drain a little bit? I think that was, it was him that was talking saying that um but yeah uh and then so there's that and then there was the uh for that size animal what are you using for uh, like a basking area are you using one big light multiple lights multiple lights um so i each of my enclosures have a big basking area it's about each basking area is two or three times longer than the animal i don't have that entire space covered with lights I only use, um, the most bulbs I use are three, three at a time. 
but I like having a long basking spot because I'll see them sometimes, you know, they'll have their tail under the light and the rest of their bodies out or, mm-hmm. or they'll have their head under one of the lights that they like better. So I, I give them a lot of space. Um, and I use multiple different types of bulbs too. I don't just use three halogens across the fixture. Um, I do use halogens. Normally I have two halogens, um, the 120 watt equivalents are what I use. I think GE or Phillips, I probably go back and forth. Um, or the PAR 38s. But what I've gotten into in the last year or so is I'll put in a DP emitter in the array. Um, and it doesn't put off any light. I don't, I'm sure you guys are familiar with that, yeah. that technology. Yeah. And I love those, and uh, it gets that hot spot really hot, and the animals will go, and they'll lay just under the the DP emitter yeah. itself. And I use I use an 80 watt DP emitter, um, and I'm a huge fan. Yeah. So that was one of the other things I, I did recently. I threw away every single um, ceramic heat emitter I owned. They're all yeah. gone. Yeah. You know, don't use them. I've used solely the deep heat emitters for non, um, non-visible non heat, you know, something that doesn't come from a light. And I'm a huge fan. Um, those those, uh, comp- those ceramic heat emitters, there's just no benefit besides heat, and it doesn't even put off that good of heat compared to yeah. the other it, stuff. It doesn't direct it very well compared to the, yep. the deep heat emitters. Yep. Now, right. uh, are you uh, using a photo period where – you're turning your PAR 38s off at nighttime and then keeping the deep heater meter on? So yeah. I, I did. Um, I, when I first started incorporating the deep heater meters in the array, I did do that. And I have cameras in every single one of my enclosures. And I looked and I looked and I have never seen a water monitor bask at night. Um, and I, I don't use the DP emitter as any, for any kind of ambient heat. It's solely to get the basking spot hot enough. Mm-hmm. So, so no, I, I don't leave them on at night. They're on the same timer as my halogens. Um, I do use an a, a IR heat source to heat my enclosures, but nothing that's going to provide a, a, a basking benefit. It's just to just keep it from going overall. To, yeah, it's just to keep it from going to like 60s, right? Is that what you're trying to do with the other bulb, the other other infrared bulb? No, 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 no. So it's not a bulb. It's actually an infrared uh, wall-mounted heater. Oh, I use okay. in all my enclosures, and it's got a built-in thermostat. Um, and so I have those mounted in all my enclosures. I love them. Yeah, nice. Because they yeah. actually, just like a herb stat, they control the amount of voltage it uses depending on your temperature fluctuations. Um, and when you have as many enclosures as I have, electricity conservation is huge. Mm-hmm. So even though this heater is, you know, capable of putting out 1,500 watts, it never is. Yeah. And the uh, the IR element is so big that it heats the enclosure so efficiently it barely ever runs. Um, I love Very it. Very nice. And I keep all my enclosures, you know, 85 to 86 degrees day and night. What uh? What brand are you using for that? The heater. The because I I've kind of looked into the same things. Uh, some of those uh, same R, like IR heat panels. Um, what what one did you go with? You know off the top of your head. So I have one that my <clears throat> ball, I, I actually have four of these. I have one in my mud room, and then I have three um, in enclosures, and I think it's called a heat storm. Okay. It's just a random. IR on Amazon. Um, the reason I like this one is it's Wi-Fi capable. Yeah. I can turn it off and on from my phone. I can adjust the temperature from my phone. Um, it, it's it's amazing, and they're not that expensive. It should last way longer than any other type of heat source, and it's so efficient that these big enclosures I have, it, it hardly runs. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah, I've, I'll look into that because um, I'm doing some stuff prepping for winter so I don't have to use these space heaters that are constantly pumping out, you know, 1,300 watts of electricity. 
um, to keep things warm. So um, I'm trying to do a, a couple different ideas. One was like the um, the heat mats uh, underneath some of the raise up cages because they're on those like garage racks. So they're actually underneath that. But um, I was thinking for the the big walk in cages these type of panels and like you said that regulate themselves so they're not constantly pulling that amount of heat um that would probably save me a lot in the in the winter time because these space heaters and the 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 hvac unit that i'm using right now they're not very efficient as far as what they're doing it's like they're just putting out that heat and also that uh that hvac unit it's um it's blowing hot air you know and uh so i have to struggle with that in the winter when humidity is already you know 10 percent maybe um so different ideas that I'm, I'm looking into so good to hear you're having good success with those and it, i'm assuming it's somewhat waterproof it's i've never had an issue um in, with humidity okay um so i i'm assuming it's it's pretty good i mean they're not built for outdoor use but they're kind of for you know, garages or, or places that aren't um, necessarily going to be humidity free, like inside your house. Yeah, I, I'm a I'm a big fan of it, and uh, the IR technology, I feel, doesn't dry the air out as much. Yeah, maybe there's science to back that up. I'm not sure, um, but I'm a huge fan of it over, especially the ceramics, and then other types of space heaters. I, I think I think you'd like it for sure, and then, and while you mentioned HVAC, so all my some of my enclosures are outside in a building that's only conditioned by what I have done to them. Mm -hmm. Like I put heaters in, um, and it they it can get extraordinarily hot in there. So one thing I two things I did this year, I installed a solar attic fan in the top of the building to pull out all that super hot air in the top. Um, and it kicks on as soon as the sun comes up in the morning and runs all the way until dusk. And uh, I've, I've been really happy with that. And I also actually installed a window AC unit in that building okay. to keep the temps down. And I think that's why I was able to have a good close to the summertime because I was able to keep it cooler in there than it probably would have been had I not been using some sort of AC system. Yeah. Yeah, man, the uh, AC has saved my butt. You know, and um, on top of that, the uh, swamp cooler also, because it runs at much less. The HVAC unit, it's a, it's also 1,300 watts. So it kicks on, it kicks off. Um, but the swamp cooler, I think it's 200 watts. And because of the the area i don't know if this would work for you in the in the summer i don't know how humid it gets there but for me the humidity is still so low that it really uh works well with that swamp cooler uh and it brings the ambient humidity inside my my warehouse up to about 55 60 percent um so it works on two levels for me so it's, it's been super helpful but it's always a game of figuring you know this stuff out because pretty soon here you know come maybe end of september october i'm gonna put that thing away and uh and be looking to change up the the room again light bulbs and and uh the heating elements that are in there making sure you know um <clears throat> i even try to keep the, the main door closed after a certain point in the uh the roll-up door closed after a certain point in the year because of that that exchange uh, I don't want to lose all that heat that I've worked so hard to trap in. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's good to know. I, I'm always on the search for these these different ideas for you know uh, mass heating and cooling rather than trying to do it in each each individual cage. It's like no, you got to treat the room as the room yeah. and take care of it that way. Um, right. But on that. Uh, on the note of heating and, and all this um, and the way you use your, your lights, what are you using as far as a basking platform? Are you just pointing the lights at the dirt or are you giving them um, like wood, stone, ceramic, something like that? It, it varies enclosure to enclosure. Um, so the building that I, I transformed into two enclosures actually already had really big shelves in it. 
So what I did was I, I tiled the shelves and then I, I put logs and stuff so they can climb up there. And that's where their basking spot is. So it's pretty high elevated off the ground. Um, mm-hmm. And I think that they like that a lot because um, they're always up there. They have windows up there. They've got the windows. They look outside. So, so that one's tile. And then a lot of my other ones are actually kind of really dark uh, landscaping stone, yeah. like slate almost. And I'll just yeah. spread that out or stack it up depending on what kind of animal it is. And I, I bought a pallet of it. So basically my garden has a pile of it. And whenever I need some, I just go out and grab it. <laughs> Very nice. Yeah. Oh, uh, yeah. I like it. You're getting, I, I'm you're getting a lot of this. More more. No, sorry. Go ahead. Oh, Go ahead I'm just now. leaning a lot uh, more towards um, like tile ceramic, something that's going to keep heat, you know, uh, and lose it at a certain rate for a lot of the uh, adult animals I have. I'm trying to work it out for the bigger ones. Um, babies, I treat a little different with the wood stacks, um, just that you know the, the way I use them um, but they're also lower temperatures uh, but the the adults um, I really like how it's kind of like a, a real quick flash basking you know run that they can do instead of uh, directed directly at wood which has worked great and you can still make it work no problem it seems to me just watching them they had to stay a little while longer under the wood uh, or on top of the wood under the basking spot and the I like the way the temperature play is between the uh, the stone and the heating element, usually the, the heating light rather than wood because they're getting a much higher temperature on their backs from the light than they would from the wood coming up. So it, um, and I don't see quite as much as that um, I, I, it's just a behavior thing when they get on a piece of slate or stone the way they like flatten out and kind of wiggle a little bit and then you know a couple minutes and they're off and running again where notice they, they hang out under the uh, the on, on wood uh, panels that I have um, a little bit longer than that so um, I'm just playing with these ideas I'd rather use stone if I can get to it and um, uh, it seems to, to give them a little more because they got that, that radiant belly heat coming off of that thing uh, when they're laying on top. Is it radiant heat? That would be... Or would it be direct? Yeah, it's, it's, <laughs> I guess it's radiating from that, that huge uh, piece of slate. Yeah. Yeah. Man, his face is gone. <laughs> what? Is it, I see. Is it, I could, you can see him? Use, yeah, I can see oh, that. So... Okay. Um, Basking spot is a really interesting topic to me, and I'm kind of on my I'm, I'm on the side of the fence where I do not want my animals basking for a long time, mm-hmm. and, I, and I think that's what you guys were saying. I I want them under there. I want them to get warm and then gone, and so I, I actually keep their basking spots very hot, a lot hotter than most people, and um, I, none of my animals get burned. And I see people with burned animals, or they're like, oh, you keep your basking spot at 150 degrees. Aren't you afraid of getting burned? And, and, and I'm absolutely not. It's because the, the time they get burned is when they can't get their core body temperature high enough, fast enough, and then they're sitting under that light for 20 minutes, 30 minutes. That's when yeah. they're getting burned because the outside of their body is cooking and the heat is not penetrating the core. And I think that's overlooked a lot, and people are. I don't want to make it burn my water monitor. And I just, I, I don't like that at all. Just get them cooked and get them out. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a there's a lot that uh, I guess is in the mix with uh, getting burned. I think some people use uh, very inadequate bulbs as well considering the room or the temperature, the type of bulb you have, uh, maybe even the, the the type of skin your lizard has too, right? So my, my mangroves have very thin skin and I've had to, I, I use a good 135, 140, uh, 140 degree surface temperatures as well. So it's not like it's anything really low, um, but I aim for about 135-ish, give or take, right? And sometimes it'll be hotter 
um, where I clock it and it's at 155 and the lizard's still using it, you know. Um, but I think some people develop these burns using spot bulbs or getting away with regular spot reptile bulbs, you know. Um, and then also looking at the, the lumens on some of these floodlights. And you can buy the same bulb, let's just say a 65 watt floodlight, and it'll have 500 lumens, uh, 650 lumens, 1500 lumens. Those one with the 1500 lumens are extremely strong. So, you know, make sure that the distance that you're using, if you guys are going through and, you know, if this correlates with what you're using on bulbs and, and if you are getting burned, um, maybe you want to look at the box and see just what the lumens is, uh, including the strength of the bulb too, because you can have a 45 watt floodlight with extremely high lumens as well. And that's a very, that's a very strong bulb. Um, so, you know, it's a, something to look at as far as when people are dealing with burn issues. And again, I get what you mentioned was when the core temperature is really cold, the room temperature is also very cold and that bulb is working extremely hard to stay hot and warm under these cooler temperatures and essentially colder temperatures then those are also uh, burn risks as well uh, just for people that are out there that are you know dealing with these issues or have dealt with these issues or you know your lizard ends up with a bunch of random white spots that you don't you know you don't know where they really came from but there, those are those are old burns that have healed that you didn't really recognize, you know. Mm -hmm. um, now, with your uh, sorry, you mentioned the the type of floodlights you get. Are you finding that it's harder and harder to find those bulbs nowadays, or is your state pretty uh, pretty lenient on the floodlight issue right now? Because I have to get mine uh, contraband into California. <laughs> 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 yeah, you, you have it rough with some of the rules that California is doing. I can still find them, but all the companies are really moving away from them and everything's becoming LED. Yeah. yeah. And I do not think LED in the near, in the meantime, are going to find the heat. Are going to put off the heat that these animals need. But um, I think you could have UV LEDs in an array with something that's putting off heat. Um, if you couldn't, if you could, if we could never get another halogen bulb, I think you could use LEDs alongside deep heat emitters and get in a appropriate basket spot. Um, yeah, that, that might be what has to happen and something I'm kind yeah, of yeah. considered. Got to really think about the play here because this is something that is actually with uh, many states, especially on, you know, the, the Western United States man they're banning floodlights so you can't you know what well, we used to go and buy sylvania and phillips floodlights that we all really utilized before as a whole as a whole monitor community now those bulbs are you know like i like i mentioned i have to i can't even find them um they're 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 past being uh, it's past now years where um i can't ask them to go to the back and search for it you know like i used to mm -hmm. now it's where it's gotten so difficult that i had just have friends from out of state just send send me a box and and it's, it's something that i got to do a few times a year for sure especially if the bulbs burn out quite fast but um yeah it's you know it sucks because you got to i I'll obviously want to pay the guy that's helping me out you know and then you got to pay for shipping and then the bulbs cost what they cost so that one bulb that was seven, eight bucks is now $22, you know? Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah. Try yeah, to it's, prep it's, for that. And yes. you know, that, that could change a lot of things too, because we might have to get into more like the deep heat projector, that type of technology, or maybe like, uh, uh, little mini, um, overhead heaters that they use, uh, you know, um, when you're like outdoor in a restaurant, something like that, just in a, uh, cage safe uh, design or whatnot. So uh, our fixtures might be changing. All of that might be changing. And like you said, LED has a ways to catch up. Especially, you know, it, you know what's funny? The 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 initial LED like flashlights would get so hot they had to engineer, you know, the uh, the structure around it so that it would dissipate heat a certain way. 
it's like no, no, bring those back <laughs> you know um but as the technology has gotten better you can actually basically put a hand on that led element and you're not getting that same same burn uh but you're also talking about a basically a little computer chip or microchip that's the thing putting off this this light so it's whole different technology than a, than a light bulb um so somebody get on that for us we need we we're still here reptile community we still need lights but yeah. you know as, as long as people are uh the crossovers as far as uh setting up you know any kind of fowl whether it's chicken quail uh they're still in that using a lot of red bulbs and you know whatever so hopefully there will still be a place a source to go to um to get some of this so we can make that, that change in technology but yeah yeah otherwise i'm gonna be building a lot of outdoor cages and uh, <laughs> yeah, I going that route with things the uh, are actually bigger than i think most people realize with these halogens because it put yeah. off um ira and irb there's not many there's no other lights out there and even a dp projector it puts off it's one or the other but it doesn't put off both like a halogen does. Mm -hmm. um, so our animals are really going to be missing out on on a lot of good ways to heat them if we lose that technology completely. Um, so it'll it'll right. be really unfortunate, but I think somebody can capitalize on it and make a business and you know keep our animals going. I'll, I'll bring it yeah. back to the U.S. and uh, start making reptile bull. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You, you know. There's still a few places um, <clears throat> that are basically the, the way the laws are written for here in California is that uh, you can't have your, your regular halogen bulb, but you label it as a reptile bulb and it's still okay. So we're talking, you know, white boxing stuff from overseas manufacturing and sticking a sticker on it that says reptile bulb. And basically you're, you're bypassing that. Um, but how how long is it going to be um how long is it going to uh be until it doesn't make sense for that business overseas to make you know uh a million of these bulbs because not only are they reptile bulbs they, they're just labeled as that they're making the same bulb for other things in a different box all over the all over the world probably but how long is it going to be until you know we don't have that anymore uh, and specifically for what we use here in the U.S. as far as our, I think it's E6, E7 is the the socket, the, the fixtures that we're used to, where other places in the world they use different, um, um, I don't know what it would be, different size sockets for their bulbs, so they're, they're not standard across the uh, world. So we'll see, because, you know, if that catches on enough and people are using different things, then, um, uh, you know, we're, we're still stuck on that. Fortunately... The LED stuff that's coming out is still for the E6, E7 sockets. But, uh, like, when you have those can lights in a home or whatnot, you know, that's not really a light bulb in there. That's just the, the can. Um, so I go off on a different rant over that. Let's get back to, to monitors. <laughs> uh, let's see. What haven't we – What we've touched on the water, the substrate you're using, uh, the basking area, you know, you're, you're feeding um, – somewhat as far as hands-on taming and especially interacting uh and you said for the most part your hands off till they get used to you right it depends you know the baby's hands-on from day one um okay yeah I, for sure I, I don't force handle them unless i absolutely have to but Got i you. am i am picking them up gently um i move them from their egg container into their enclosure by hand that's when a baby water monitor is the most violent. They come out of those eggs and they're, they're nothing but vinegar, man. They're like <laughs> right on you. Um, but I feel like them losing that fear immediately is kind of important. Um, yeah. Cause they, they can bite onto me and I don't hurt them. I just don't do it. And I'll put them in their enclosure and then they'll walk off. And then we kind of build this little bond. So anybody who gets a water monitor for me, I've taken the light for you. Like, <laughs> but I think that really does get them used to people. Um, the adults, I because of the way I got into this, I didn't buy animals that were 
raised from you know, an egg, came down, and then were these great golden retrievers. I got some wild caught animals and imported animals, and they are they're spicy. Um, yeah. But <laughs> I still interact with them, and each of them has their own personality. Each of them has their own line in the sand. Um, Jade, the girl who my, my business is named after, I've had her since the beginning, and I can now, I can pet her, she'll eat from my hand, and we kind of have this understanding. I'll walk in her cage and she'll let me know with a, you know, a warning tail whip or something, don't come near me. At that point, I just leave the food then and I, I leave. I walk in there, her tongue's flicking, she'll eat from my hand, she'll let me pet her, and you know, in those days we have really good interaction. It's just neat how she has developed her personality. I have big males that are scared at the very side of me, and I can't get anywhere near them. I have some that will get to the highest point in the cage, and they'll just watch me. Uh, I can't get near them either, but they don't run. They're just like, okay, get in here, get out. Um, so it, it's really interesting. I love all their personalities. I'm not upset that I can't pick them up and, and you know watch Netflix with them or anything. It's, uh, it, it's fun, and the babies are so different in personality, too. Some of them come out of the egg, and they just want to be around you. They want to crawl out of the cage on you, and just chill, explore, um, and that's amazing. I don't know what makes them do that. You can have two wild-caught animals and get an animal that comes out of the egg, first generation, that will crawl right out of the cage on your arm. No questions at any time. Yeah. Other ones, it takes a while. You gotta put your hand near them. It might take five minutes, they'll yeah. come over, they'll start licking it, then they'll run away. Um, and that takes time, it's a very iterative process. You just keep doing that day after day after day. And pretty soon, um, you know, they'll be eating out the palm of your hands. You just have to be slow with some, and some you don't. But it's, it's all fun to me. Um, I, I love all of it. I spend time with everybody's animals, even though I know I'm not going to be able to keep any of them. Uh, my kids do it. And my kids come down, and the ones that are already tamed, they'll walk onto my children's arms, and my kids can pet them on the chin. And we're talking two, three week old animals, and it, it, it's just amazing how smart they are and how confident and bold they can get. Um, Zach, it seems like we're losing your volume a little bit. You got real, real quiet. Did you lean? Was that it? You lean back? <laughs> I do that sometimes. Oh. Hold on. Well, you were, we're not you hearing were, anything you now. You were good for a minute and then you cut out. <laughs> I'm not I'm not sure what it's. Uh, well, I think it might. I'm not sure if it might be your end. Um, my. I can hear you, and then is it, it, you'll, it could be the it could be the link. I'm not I'm not sure. I've never used this link before. Oh, we're hearing you now. Don't move, yeah, Zach. Don't. <laughs> <laughs> um, you you also touched on your your business, uh, Jade Reptiles. We probably should have covered that at the beginning, so people knew who we were talking about. Um, you know, this is my first time talking to you, but uh, yeah. It's, I, we'll cover it at the end also, but um, um, Jade Reptiles and what else do you, what else do you got your hands into besides the uh, water monitors? So I have Jade Reptiles. I named it after my, my, you know, my first female, the one that's, you know, just kind of my little favorite. Um, but I'm starting to get into Australian stuff. Slowly but surely, um, I've got a big group of of Pilbarensis that I'm raising up. I have a, an adult pair of Kangorums. And nice. I have one adult Tristus and one adult Lace Monitor. Oh boy. <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm just trying to figure out exactly what I want to do. Uh, the Pilbarensis were the first Australian monitors that I got. And I really wanted to get something small, something that's not going to be as crazy as the water monitors. And um, I really don't like mixing things. So I was I bought a group of six, um, three from one breeder, two from another, 
and one come a third. Okay. And I think I finally figured out the trio that I want. I'm gonna keep, um, and then I'm gonna I'm gonna rehome the other three. Um, the yeah. other three are a trio as well. So it's very tempting for me to keep those. And I'm like, who you know, who needs six pilgrimages? You do. <laughs> <laughs> But, uh, yeah, man, no at, one, at one point I had six Kimberly's adult adults, and I was like, you know what? This is a lot of stress. <laughs> oh, it's a lot of bugs. Yeah. It's, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, a lot of bugs. But man, when you know you got to deal with multiple females going, and you know some of them share their enclosures, some of them were separate, and then I had to separate many of them, right? And then I was just like, all right, I can't. I can't hang on to all all five or six of you, so eventually I was dwindling, you know, dwindling numbers to to and even two or three girls, you know, that's all I all I wanted to handle anyways, right? Still being a per, productive enough as far as having those many girls, but you know, you it's just a, a bit less stress from having five or six of them. So yeah, man, I then then I got down to a couple of females, and I was like, all right, this is a good number still, because regardless even if they're small man you get dwarf monitors going and it's like they never stop you know yeah. we, actually, we actually had a conversation on how to how to try to stop them you know once they once they lay it's it can be every every 30 days that they, they can have clutches you know oh yeah yeah was, sure um yeah we'll see what i do with these rock monitors but i really love them and they're 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 amazing and um they're used to me now. They'll crawl out onto my hand. They're they're, oh, nice. they're fantastic little animals. And um, but I think my favorite dwarf, and I've wanted a pair for years, are the <clears throat> King Gorums, and I just got them. Nice. I'm very, very excited about these. Um, they're adults. They're wonderful and looking animals. I think I might they're venture not- that way in the future with that that same species. Um, but for something at the house, um, just to, just to have here visually, uh, usually in the the kid's room, I switch them up, you know, they'll have this species or that species. It goes for about a year and then we're, we're, uh, onto another species and they're helping out, you know, doing things. But, um, yeah, those are definitely on that list for, for being at the house just cause they look so stunning, you know? Um, Yeah. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to that. That'll that'll be sometime yeah. in the future. But <laughs> so I'll hit I'll hit you up when you start yeah, having some sure. success. Yeah, that sounds good. Uh, the kid yeah. the kid gorms are absolutely. If you look at them up close, they're like a mini savannah monitor. They've got this head shape that's not really like other monitors. Um, yeah, and they're just so tiny. And they're yeah. adorable. I, it, but they really, when you get up close, at least to me, they don't look like an Austin monitor. Um, they are. I mean, they're amazing. Really happy I was able to get this yeah. pair. Very nice. Very, very nice. nice. Uh, is your is your lace monitor? Is it it's a, a normal phase a nail? Normal? Um, he, he has he has produced bell babies. Um, I. Think yeah. So okay, he's got, okay. he's got the gene in there. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I don't know. I don't know where I'm going with that with that animal just yet. If I can find a, a you know a ready to breed female, that would be cool. But uh, right now I'm just kind of keeping him and caring for him, and, and we'll see where we go. Yeah. yeah. Now is keeping that lace monitor and how you how you how what we talked about and how you applied it to the water monitors is it care and everything like that similar or are you finding that the australian stuff can just handle a lot the australian stuff is fair they're very very robust um the lace i keep you know, obviously the parameters aren't the same as the water monitor. They don't need the giant water feature. Um, I find at least keeping the mail, it, it really is a lot less complex than the water monitors. Uh, I don't have a female. 
and as you know, females, as far as reproductive stuff it go, they're just trickier. They have their own complications, their own things you have to look out for. Um, but one of the video series that I studied when I was getting into this was actually how to breed lace monitors um, by uh, David Kirshner out in Australia. So they are similar yeah. because I, I learned about, you know, vitiligenesis and, you know, feeding them more and all that stuff by watching how he did it with lace monitors. And I applied a lot of the stuff I learned from him and then stuff from Corey. Um, and I kind of combined it all. And I tell people I got lucky because, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, this is, this is biology we're playing with here. And to get it, I think, as fast as I did, a little bit of luck had to had to pay, uh, play into it. I always had good pairings. I never had a male or female that wouldn't mate with each other. Um, there's got to be some luck that plays into that. Right. Yeah, yeah I've, I've, I've experienced this. similar. <laughs> Dave, uh, Dave just re released episode eight of that whole breeding series i don't know I if you've not. seen it yet yep so you've seen the you've seen the beginning episodes of that series right yeah he just if today is what saturday i think thursday morning he put it up but because he put it up at such an odd time it's kind of you know a bunch of stuff has piled up over it throughout the day but mike stefani shared it on um, a few pages and you should be able to find it if you look for episode eight yeah, um, I, I have it. I was going to actually watch it today uh, once I got the time after this uh, and I was in my room. I was going to listen to it. Um, but yeah, it's uh, I think of many of us as far as who we consider, you know, a great education mentor. Man, Dave, Dave Kirshner is up there, I think, as number top five or top two guys, really, on what he's provided for us. Um, and it's. It's not like he just appeared randomly. He's been doing this longer since we, most of us have been really keeping. And, um, you know, yeah, David Kirshner, if you ever hear this, man, we, the whole community as of monitors, we really appreciate everything that you do for us, you know? Yeah. Um, cause yeah, it's a lot, it's a lot of effort to work and do that on top of his normal get up, right? Um, what he has to do with the zoo and things like that for him to actually make those YouTubes for us. If, um, they're, you know, they're not just, a uh, an excitement or, you know, uh, I don't know how to say it, but it's just some some crazy attraction where people are feeding or getting bit by monitors. It's actually great educational stuff, you know. Um, and, uh, yeah, we don't we don't really get that a whole lot on YouTube. Yeah. So that's uh, – It's really good stuff. Yeah, I, I guarantee great, great that stuff. I'm not the only person who, when they first started, studied that video series. I was just looking. I, I was just uh, saving that you said that next episode came out, so I was making sure I. <laughs> yeah, yeah. To be he, watched. He didn't, he didn't do a whole lot to promote it. He just put it up on a thing and said, "All right, here you go. There's episode eight. Well, we'll you know, do it. Um, Everybody that's listening, you know, all three of us. <laughs> go, go and uh, give that a watch. It's really good stuff. Uh, whether you're ever planning on breed monitors or not, just their behaviors and what they do, what they're capable of. So, uh, yeah, it's a, if you don't know who Dave Kirshner is on YouTube or many places, he's a uh, Croc Doc 2, right? Mm -hmm. Croc Doc 2. And so you'd be able to C R O C D O C 2 on YouTube, and you'll be able to find lace monitor stuff and you'll find the series because. It'll probably be a top trending thing, but man, he's got, he's got episodes from years ago that we, he used to train, teach us and train us on what to do. And so if you see heated nest bins and you see, you know, um, applications of UV or how he cools his monitors down, you know, actually giving them the whole winter, right. And then, you know, goes back, goes, warms back up and it shows us everything. Um, mm -hmm. It's like a god godfather to all of us, really. What kind of area rug to to buy to? Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> get them going on. That's a joke. You'll have to watch it. Um, 
All right, guys, we're right about that hour 45 mark. Um, we covered a lot of good stuff, though. Yeah. Uh, it was great having you on, man. Have, yeah. Love to have you on again. Get some of those uh, Australian stuff cooking and, and come back and talk about it. But um, as we touched on, uh, so, where can people um, find you? I do a lot of posting on Facebook. I know I'm kind of old school that way. But I post everything on uh, my Facebook page, Jade Reptiles. Very rarely on my personal page. Um, and then I'm on Instagram, Jade underscore Reptiles. Those are really my only two platforms that I have right now. But, uh, Hey, that's about all I do. <laughs> yeah. yeah it's, Cover it's, half the world exactly. with that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I really appreciate you guys having me on. And, uh, no, it was, it was great, man. And it's nice to meet you recently, too, and, and all that. We really appreciate you for coming on as a as a water – to talk about the water monitors and things Absolutely. like that. We gotta, we're trying to get uh, other guys to come on. It's just time frame, you know, and – and when people are able to record and honestly the with the normal way the world's working you know everything is going up people are working harder um people are grinding more on their their daily lives their hardy so i mean like alan and myself even though we we try to talk as much as we can man there's there's times where we're busy almost all day and we really can't get to doing these as often as we'd like and at the same time have have guests on with the same free time so man we really appreciate you for being flexible um thank you very much for, for coming on you know um and this is episode what like 30 now almost 30 now Gosh. we've got a few we've got a few yeah. in the books i think it's between 25 and 30 something like that um i'd have and, to go back uh, and count <laughs> yeah we gotta go back and count uh, i just started but, uh, keeping yeah. yeah keeping better track in the numbers of where we're at um, it's because it's, it's been a, it's been a, it's been a little while before it was like weekly and then you know we we're just we got so busy with everything we try to get in once a month now you know once a month we'll have a guest on and we'll try to have it be just like it was this one very educational sometimes it is just us chopping chopping up game and you know just giving each other um ideas back and forth but you know the real education was something like this here which i really appreciate again Absolutely. You know yeah. Thanks, man. All right. All right, Kai, where can people find you? Um, I, I'm mostly on Facebook. You, I'm most responsive on there, so you can find me at Kai Fan on, on Facebook. Um, you can find me also on Instagram as uh, big underscore lizard. Uh, sorry yeah big underscore lizard 103 um and you know you'll find me at mangrove mecca or california grasshoppers um i'm also on on there on instagram as well um and then you can also find me here you know underneath the morelia python network yeah. what about Bye, you guys. man uh you can find me on facebook at uh origins reptile and then on instagram at origins underscore reptile um also for we're brought to you by the morelia python radio network uh, as kai mentioned you can find them on moreliapythonradio.net um you can go there for all kinds of different stuff um uh you can also if you have any questions for us or for eric uh, you can email at info at moreliapythonradio.com and you can also follow um, their different podcasts and what the network has going on on Instagram. They've on Morelia all Python. sorts of stuff now. Yeah. Like boa stuff, field herping stuff, Australia stuff, the, you know, the normal carpet stuff, but he's, he's, trying, he's trying to cover a little bit of everything for all of you guys. So Absolutely. And it's, it's all there. And even if it's uh, not something directly, I don't know what now, because it seems like they have all species covered. Um, but within those shows, especially uh, Morelli Python Radio, they've had such a number of guests on in the last, I don't know, 10, 11 years. Um, they probably have some episodes covering that specific species if you're interested in it uh, or whatnot. So there's a lot to binge on, a lot to listen to, and some great information along with some uh, some great people. And, you know, there's there's even, uh, I want to point out, there's there's some people that aren't 
necessarily with us anymore. That were some of the early keepers that were um, just great sources of information. And it's so interesting on how they got things done in the early uh, reptile world. So give them a listen if you're interested in uh, what they're talking about. They can also, there's I think there's just um, episodes on just materials like books and where to find them uh, to get some of this good information. Because we can all geek out on whatever whatever we're into at the time you want to know everything about. So um, it's a good place to start. All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you very much. Until uh, we do this again, Zach, I wish you luck over this next year. I'll be watching. Um, yeah, we'll try to try to have you on for some Pilbara stuff. That's that'd be a great episode, man. If when you get your first clutch going or something like that, I'll try to I'll, I'll pay attention, man. I'll see you stuff. We'll we'll ask you to come on again because that'd be a great species to talk about. We talk about all the other ones, but but Pilbara is just because we don't keep them, you know. Right. Yeah, it'd be great. All right, guys. Hey, it was right. nice nice to nice to have have uh, have you guys today and everything like that. See you guys later, man. Have a good one, Zach.